Welcome to the backstory on one of the lowest profile but highest stakes needs in Longmont, Colorado and every other community in the United States. My name is Tim Waters and I've been invited by the Longmont Observer and Longmont Public Media to moderate conversations of leaders, advocates, experts, and policymakers on topics of interest and relevance to Longmont area residents. This month, we're focusing on young families with young children, concerned that we are failing both because of insufficient child care and early childhood, early childhood learning opportunities in Longmont. Every story about an issue or problem you read in the newspaper or on the Longmont Observer website has a backstory. The backstory, a backstory that is typically more interesting and engaging than what gets reported as news. This month, we're telling a story that is understood all too well by moms, dads, and grandparents with children and grandchildren under the age of six. It's a story that is less well understood by business owners and primary employers, but one with huge implications for them. It's one that seldom draws the kind of intensity of attention and support it deserves from local policymakers. Yet, because of its implications for nearly every goal or objective, the school board members, city council members, and county commissioners establish when setting priorities, it's one about which we all need to learn more. Indeed, it is the backstory of a challenge so complex, so pervasive, of such consequence and of such significance that we're telling it in a series of no less than three of these podcasts. These will be produced and posted in, in sequence on the Longmont Public Media website. Uh, the video of these will run over uh, Channel 8 and on the Longmont channel on uh, YouTube. So just for anybody who watches this, understand uh, we've done eight of these. Uh, they're all posted on the Longmont, Web, uh, Longmont Observer website. They've all been audio podcasts. This is our first video and audio podcast. So we're learning our way forward. Uh, so if, if you have feedback to share with us on how to make this more engaging and entertaining and informative, uh, we'll appreciate that. In this podcast, I'm joined by four outstanding panelists. Danielle Butler, immediate to me, immediately to my left, is the executive director of the Boulder County Early Childhood <coughs> Council. Jessica Erickson, to my right, is the CEO of the Longmont Eco Economic Development Partnership. Uh, and she is now going to go, <laughs> go take care of my cough. Richard Garcia, to my left, is a founder of the Co uh, Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition. He's a member of the Boulder Valley School Board, and I will add he is the proud father of a candidate for the United States Senate in the state of Colorado, Lorena Garcia, who will be a, one of our panelists in the third of these podcasts. And Dr. Bob Norris, who is um, a local activist. Bob has dedicated his life in, in Longmont uh, to, to issues of, of consequence. Bob is also a board member of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to talk less and listen more. I'm going to start by asking our panelists to uh, share a little bit about themselves and, and what draws them to this area of interest in this podcast today. Richard, let's start with you. Thank you, Tim. Um, and thank you for the introduction. And thank you for that little plug for Lorena Garcia, who is running for the United States Senate. If you're, not, if you're wondering what this is, this is a volunteer circulator and all of her uh, work is going to be on the ground, volunteer. She doesn't have the millions of dollars like everybody else does. But anyway, that's another story. Um, and you mentioned that I was the founder of the Statewide Parent Coalition, which was founded in 1980. It's got a long history. And the primary purpose of that particular organization is to give parents a heads up uh, giving them information and, uh, and also provide them with the skills that they need to make sure that their children have the same opportunities that other children have. Um, one thing about me that many people probably don't know is that I used to teach early childhood education at the Community College of Denver for about five years, and I created the bilingual uh, child development social credential program at the Community College of Denver, uh, that was approved by the Council for Professional Recognition in Washington. Uh, everyone that came out of that particular program was eligible to uh, apply for a CDA credential, 
which in Colorado is one of the requirements that the Colorado uh, Shine uh, program uh, has in order for people to be competent child care providers. Uh, during that time, one of the things that I learned is, and th I'm talking about way back in the 80s, uh, something called, that we termed at that time, the trilemma. Well, let's come back. We're, okay. we're going to start with the trilemma, but we're going to go through these introductions, but we'll come right back to it. And yeah. Hi there. Uh, yes, so my introduction to the world of early childhood came about um, through working in community consultation years ago. And I ended up um, working in a child care program and a, at the government level. And what I discovered quite quickly and kept my interest all these years is the socioeconomic impact that a healthy child care system has in a local community. It's a very interesting place to work. So, yes, I'm dedicated to children and children's well-being and um, their success in life. Most of the people in our, our area probably come from it from that direction, but I come from it slightly different, from the interest in uh, policy planning and uh, community development. So, um, and then along the way, um, the, the information and the research and the studies and the feedback around the extremely powerful impacts of healthy social emotional development of children, uh, how that has lifelong impacts, just increases my interest and commitment in the field, in my mind. And, and I know just enough about your background to know that uh, part of what drew, the, you, drew you to this area of work is your own experience as a mom when, mm -hmm. when your kids were younger. And, and the difficulty in finding the kind of quality reliable <clears throat> care that you knew that they needed. That's right. That's right. I'm a consumer of child care in Boulder County myself. My daughter is now uh, 18 and just about to graduate um, high school. So she started in child care uh, at two and a half when we moved back to Boulder County. So, um, and in fact, um, yeah, so each year, and things change for, for a family. Every year, child care and your child care arrangements have to change because the child growth and the needs change. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, an employee of mine and another colleague of mine have asked me to sit down and talk about what did you do over the summers when your child was small? And there's a number of, of strategies, personal strategies I have, but they've also asked me, you know, what are the, what are the local strategies? What, what programs can I use? And, and I'm going to have to tell them that, you know, it's a patchwork system. And you're on your own uh, because, unfortunately, our early childhood system for birth to fives is still very fragmented. And uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to get into these questions. There's going to be a point in time where I'm going to ask this panel to talk about what's happening here right now that may or may not be different than what's happening in other places. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's what's behind what's happening now is to try to do less patchwork and more tapestry or weaving together, right, uh, what the whole cloth is of a, of a systematic, reliable, high-quality um, approach that serves every child, not just some. I, I like that visual. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go to my right. Jessica uh, is not only the CEO, mm -hmm. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, is an expected mom, um, and so you have you have perspectives here that um, are are big and really focused. Tell us about you and what draws you to this. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for including me on this panel. I think we get question about the correlation between early childhood yep. education and economic development. So look forward to having the opportunity to talk about that a little bit today. Um, just some of my background, I have been doing economic development on the front range in Colorado for um, about 17 years now, from Broomfield to Thornton, now Longmont, spent a couple of years in the governor's office. So I have a broad perspective of the region in terms of economic development. And one thing that's different today um, than what we've seen in the past about economic development is the focus on talent, talent development and talent attraction. Where goes um, talent is where goes business investment, job creation, opportunity, and a growing economy. <coughs> and a piece of that today is availability of um, early childhood and um, quality of education in general um, for the talent that we're trying to attract and develop here. So um, that's where I think we fit into the conversation and, and look forward to um, uh, making that correlation as part of this conversation. No doubt. If, we're going to be, if the city is going to be successful on these other objectives we, we set, 
economic development and workforce preparation is part of that. If, if we don't get this part of the equation right, uh, all those other efforts become a little suboptimized, mm -hmm. right? So um, just uh, tangential to that, uh, the, 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 the private sector interest in this it goes beyond um, just recruiting you know, big business because of that talent recruitment effort. And uh, the, the, as, as listeners will learn, as this coalition around this topic has grown, the, the American Association of University Women has become, have become involved. Um, but they started, before they got involved with this, they, were, they started with focus on a living wage and, re and realized fairly quickly that a living wage is very relative to what's happening with housing, availability, and attainability, and, and affordability, and childcare. So um, all those conversations we hear about economic development and living wages, if we don't get this right, those, again, um, become just hypotheticals. Uh, if, we, if we don't have it right here. Bob, you've been in this field for a long time, retired chemical engineer. Yeah, a long time. No, I'm a chemist. <laughs> it's illegal for me to claim to be an engineer. Uh, and and our, my introduction to you was as, <coughs> as an activist, and you've got, your, you've got your interest in a number of places, but this is one you've, de you've devoted a lot of time and energy, and, and some might look at that and say, well, what's, what would draw guys our age right, into this kind of conversation? Why are you here? Okay. Um, as I kind of oozed out of being a environmental consultant and looking for something to do, by chance, almost across the street, I went into El Comite one day, volunteered, ended up on the board, ended up on the board of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition and the Hispanic Education Foundation, which is the other end of this, uh, getting ways to help people get to college. Um, so in all of that experience, I became very aware of the many ways uh, that the Hispanic community is not getting as much opportunities as those of us that are more fortunate. And I particularly became aware of the achievement gap, which you can read about frequently in the trends report from the Community uh, Foundation. So about three and a half years ago, Richard asked me to lunch. And shortly after that, I ended up on the board of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition, which turned out to be a good thing. Even if you moved on a few months after I was on the board, because maybe you couldn't take me too long. <laughs> but anyway, Richard and I became, the three of us, Richard, um, Tim, and Bob Palachi, and I started meeting at my house about a year ago, talking about this issue. And in the meantime, and we'll talk more about it, we had the, uh, uh, the mayor's uh, child care forum, and we had another uh, meeting at the in the fall, I think. Uh, I don't know, October, September thirteenth. Okay, at at the museum uh, because the state wanted to know why there's fewer daycare uh, stuff. So this kind of all comes together, and, and it meets with what's important to me is that folks that don't look like me, and by that I mean white, haven't had the opportunities that I can. And so I need to try to help, and at the same time, to try to help in a way that I don't use my white privilege to force my way onto other people's ideas. So I'm glad to be working with all of you. All right, here we go. So to tee up the content of this conversation, uh, I want to remind listeners and viewers that Longmont City Council has adopted seven goals for the city. These goals include priorities like housing, economic development, environmental protection, workforce preparation, which I mentioned a bit ago. But one of these goals reads like this. We'll have an integrated system to that uh, system, uh, system we'll have an integrated systems approach that leverages human and social capital to provide high quality pre-K learning opportunities for all of our children so that they have a good start in life. Now, with that thought in mind, the focus of the podcast is early childhood education and childcare. This panel, I've asked to be prepared to address the kind of the big picture on those issues. Richard, I've heard talk about a trilemma, not a dilemma, but a trilemma that states, counties, and municipalities face when taking on challenges of early childhood education and childcare. So I want to start the conversation by asking Richard to give us his kind of overview of the trilemma, and then we're going to move from there. Uh, thank you again, Tim. Uh, let me kind of give you a little bit of background in terms of the trilemma. Uh, if you go back in history, like 
to the late 70s, 80s, uh, there was a lot of publicity because of child care providers getting in trouble, uh, kids being placed in danger. Uh, all of those things was, were happening, and particularly in, 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 in our county. Uh, there were issues that came up. Uh, so many of the professionals at that time were looking at what can we do to improve the quality of early learning opportunities uh, in the state of Colorado. Uh, so they, we met and we were meeting constantly uh, trying to look at that problem. Uh, so as a result of that, because of quality being at the peak of the triangle, if you will, uh, they were looking at, okay, what, what can we do to improve the quality of, of, of uh, early learning opportunities? One is to make sure that you have highly qualified providers in those particular areas. Uh, so then you have a number of private uh, early learning providers also that were particularly, that were involved in, in, in the conversations. Uh, so the, the providers were saying, okay, so if we increase the quality, that means that we're gonna have to pay more for our providers. Uh, so if we pay more, then we're gonna have to get the money from someplace. So the money's gonna come from the tuition that we're gonna charge our clients that bring it to, the, to, to our centers. Uh, so if we charge more, then you, you, you're dealing with affordability at that time, and who can afford to pay more? And if we charge more, then you're dealing with this whole issue of accessibility. Because if you look at who has access to high-quality child care centers, at that time, you didn't have CCAP either, by the way. CCAP, Colorado Child, Child Assistance, Care Assistance Program. Program. Uh, so who is going to provide the uh, uh, opportunity or the assistance, let's say, for people that are in the low-income bracket to be able to send their kids to these particular quality child care centers? So in those days, you had basically Head Start, Okay, that was taking care of kids that were four-year-olds. Uh, you didn't have it. You didn't have other stuff. You didn't even have early Head Start in those days. Uh, and uh, uh, then um, there were uh, families that couldn't afford it, so they would take their kids to the auntie to take care of their kids while they went to work, or they would take their kids to the friend next door or the neighbor next door, or a friend to take care of the kids. Uh, so that's how this trilemma came about in terms of quality, cost, equity, and accessibility. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we've been dealing with that since then. And what's different now uh, uh, from then is that child care is now way up here in terms of the discussion that many uh, policymakers are having, whether it be a city, whether it be a county, whether it be the state, but yet, with the exception of one city that I know, which is the city of Longmont, uh, they have not provided any kind of financial assistance to anything, okay, to make this trilemma start going away. Uh, uh, and and uh, it's a small amount that the city of Longmont is providing. However, it's something. Uh, the uh, the other issue. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember Don Horton, who used to work for the public health department. Mm -hmm. Don Horton had this this. Uh, I don't know whether it was an attraction or what it was, but he wanted to know more about an informal child care network in Boulder County. He, and then he came to the Statewide Parent Coalition and asked, could you guys do a study on that and figure out if there is an informal child care <coughs> network in Boulder County? I said, certainly, we'll do that. 
So we, the Statewide Parent Coalition, conducted a study in Boulder County to find out where is this informal child care net? Does it exist? And where is it? So we started looking at holding focus groups with neighbors, with friends, with a whole bunch of folks to find out if they were caring for kids in their home. And lo and behold, there's a huge network of uh, family friend neighbor child care providers in Boulder County. And then we were asking, well, what do you need to make your job a lot better, a lot easier? Uh, and they said, we need training. Yeah. We need to do more with that. So lo and behold, through the Statewide Parent Coalition, working arm in arm with the city of Boulder in those days, because you didn't have the council, you had, it was called something else. I can't remember what it was. The Early Childhood Council. It was, yeah, we were still the council. We were just with the city of Boulder. But that was a fun project, also. Right, but it was it was uh, it was their own nonprofit because the state didn't have a state law that 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 gave birth to the councils. Okay, but it was a council. We have council. Right. I shouldn't want to confuse it with city council. Right, but I want to get some. I, let's, yeah. I want to get other people. And so okay. let's go. So yeah. so, so so very quickly uh, because of the the uh, the uh, vision that many of these people had in the council. Uh, they wrote a proposal to the federal government, and it was the last grant that the Early Learning Opportunity Act mm -hmm. provided, and it provided the city of Boulder with about uh, very close to a million dollars to continue the work on early childhood education. And PASO, Providers Advancing Student Outcome, was born from that, mm -hmm. which gave the training and gives the training and continues to do that the family, friend, neighbor, child care providers. But anyway, you understand the trilemma yeah. that we're in. And until we get government entities or some other funding source to be able to support that trilemma, we're going to be in a trilemma for a heck or, of a long or time. Not to support it so much as to address it or overcome uh, it. Uh, address it and support it. Yeah, well, it's a great, it's a great visual quality right. uh, access or accountability. Affordability and, account yeah. and uh, accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, part of what we're doing in, right now in Longmont is, is a legacy to the work that you've been working, the work you've been doing for decades. Danielle, as the, as the executive director of the Child Council, Boulder County, um, what's your take on this, uh, both in terms of a, <clears throat> a challenge and what you see as opportunities moving forward? Yes, it's true. Uh, we have been working on um, the same thing for many years, but that's how long this work takes. Uh, we're working at the local level, but it's a national conversation, and it's even an international conversation. Early childhood, and our understanding of it, is growing leaps and bounds, at least in the last uh, 20 or more years that I've been involved. So talking about the trilemma, as uh, other times it's called the availability, accessibility, and affordability of child care. And when I first started, we used to talk about it as the three-legged stool. So with your three-legged stool, you've got one leg that's real short or missing. You don't have a stool that stands up. And you're constantly shoring up one of those legs, working on one of those legs as, as you build the system or as you build awareness. So the capacity is, is interesting, and, and if it's helpful in Longmont, uh, Longmont has 81 licensed child care facilities. So those are centers, preschools, and family child care homes. So when you look at availability, is that enough? Is that enough for Longmont? And then accessibility, that means, are they in the right place? Can parents find them? Can they get to them? Do they open in time? Do they stay open long enough for a working parent? Um, and do they have the, the, uh, the right programs? Uh, do we need bilingual programs? Do we need special needs? So th those are the th issues that we look at in accessibility. And then affordability is the issue of fees. Who pays for this and looking at this fragmented system? So, you know, K through 12, we know what that looks like. We know that there's public funding in place and there's school boards that decide how many are spent. Monies are spent on curriculum and teachers and bricks and mortar. In the birth to five area, we have, uh, it's carried by parent fees. So these are young parents um, or parents of young children. And what else do they have on their financial docket? They have mortgages, they have health insurance. All of these costs are a lot more expensive than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And the intensity of pressure that we put on young families is just too much. So that's a part of looking looking at all of this too. Um, it's 
Yeah, does that help? Those it does. Questions? It does. <clears throat> it has. Uh, my, just recently had a chance to visit with a team at one of our one of our premier local mm -hmm. child care. Well, from actually zero to five centers. <clears throat> and as we were talking about cost, it was clear that um, given the hours that parents were working and the hours children would be would be involved, uh, they 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 could enroll their children in the preschool program for about the same cost as they could at University of Colorado. It's that's, that steep in some cases. That's true. But, you know, there's something in the early childhood field where we work, the, the needs are so urgent and we're always tackling the next problem or going for the next grant uh, because there isn't funding. So we have to fund it through grant opportunities or if we can have some vision at a city council that will put some money on the table or, or the state. But what something we don't do is we don't stop enough to look at how far we have come. So the story isn't all sad news. We have made some big strides. The, child, the um, CCAP system, a child care assistance program across the state of Colorado, is funded better than ever now. And there's groups and people looking at that and figuring out how to fund it even better. Uh, Boulder County is one of the um, leading counties as far as figuring out additional funds for that program. Uh, that would be a whole other interesting podcast. But there are happy stories there. We have made progress. There's just so much more to do, and I would like to see it really shift towards the parents that we have now. We have millennial parents, and we even have Gen Z starting to have kids. We've got to ask them how they think and how they feel and what they need, because it may not be what I needed, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, so as we move forward with this, and I'm going to switch this over to, to Jessica, <clears throat> as you're, as I hear you uh, describe the fact that we do have, or show that we have, do we do have good news stories? We've made progress yeah, we since 1970. Uh, what triggers for me is how big a change is this in society general, generally in Colorado more specifically than, than really specifically in Long Run. Uh, and I, while we made progress, I still think it's it's for some people a pretty big change from where we've been to where we're going. And uh, which I think requires all of us to be really clear, clear on our theories of change and what motivates people. And in my view, people are motivated by desperation or aspiration or mm -hmm. some combination. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's the combination in this case that keeps us moving aspirationally towards uh, a better future, understanding that, um, that some people are really struggling right now mm -hmm. with access and affordability, and, and uh, even as we see quality improve. Jessica. Not a hypothetical for LEDP. So um, the implications are serious for you as a, as a CEO. I, I just, people should know, when I um, asked Jessica to serve on this panel, uh, she initially deferred, ah, there were other people would bring more information. I said, I don't think so. Um, you're, you're the poster child for why this is so important in long run and everything. You are high profile, very successful, prominent, valued CEO in this, in this community. You should not be in a position of making either or decisions once you become along. So um, in order to keep you where we, we would like you in your CEO seat, it seems to me you and, and many women and dads just like you, uh, you deserve for policymakers and others to take a serious look at uh, how, can we, how can we manage both of these challenges or respond to both of our needs. Talent here and care for your newborn as he or she comes along. So talk about from a CEO perspective, why this is so important from an from LEDP. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the kind words, I appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna start big picture and then um, talk a little bit about kind of me personally and, and where I'm at and some of the, the considerations that we're having to make as a family as we um, get ready to have our little one in a couple months. Um, so I think from an economic development perspective and a policy perspective, it wouldn't surprise most people to know that most children in this country are raised in households that have two um, working parents or where both parents or the only parent in the household um, is working. And that generally when the need arises, um, like in the case of a newborn child, that um, it's typically the female adult who stays home, um, whether that be for medical reasons or newborn reasons or a variety of other reasons. That's typically what happens. Um, I think it might be a bit more surprising that um, as of 2017, re most recent data that's available, mm -hmm. nearly half of mothers in this country are the sole or primary breadwinners in, this in their households. Um, and that increases exponentially when you start to look at minority populations and 
um, uh, people in poverty. Um, and this has been true for over a decade. But the reality is, is that workplace and public policies, like some of those that we're talking about today, don't reflect this reality. Um, they're typically based on the premise that um, families have easy access to a caregiver that can stay home um, and not have to work, um, that that person is female, which is generally true, and that um, that this will have no impact on the economics of the family or that family's ability to contribute to their local or um, state economies through um, consumer spending, through home ownership, through all of the other things that um, uh, all the other economic pressures that families have today. And so I think where um, employers um, can start to address some of those policies and um, have their employer policies start to match um, the reality of the world today, um, they're going to have more success in attracting and retaining talent. And then we as policymakers or you as <coughs> policymakers, um, both at the local and state level, being able to match public policy with the reality of the world today is going to result in our ability to continue to attract and retain talent, such as myself, that is needed in a community to keep our economy strong and vibrant. So that's kind of my big picture. Um, when I think about my story personally, though, which I've done a lot since talking to Tim about um, participating in this um, podcast and thinking about the goal of city council to create a good start in life for all children in our community, I start to think about my desire, obviously, to create a good start in life for my child when she's born in a couple of months. And then thinking about that from the perspective of that trilemma of quality, affordability, and availability of childcare here in our community. Obviously, the affordability piece speaks to my ability to create a good economic start in life for my child. Um, quality, a good social, um, social, emotional, and intellectual start to life. And then availability, just general quality of life for our family and being able to have access to that resource in our community becomes um, incredibly important in this situation. And so the reality of our situation is that we are going to have to take that into consideration when we think about where our family ends up in the future, um, where we have access to that quality, affordability, and availability. And I have to say, I do appreciate the city of Longmont for um, addressing this. It's timely for me, obviously, um, but um, really appreciate that there are people like you and like Councilman Waters that are really looking at this closely um, for people like me and some of the others that are working in our community. Um, so I'm going to, uh, Jessica just referred to me as Councilman Waters. I wear a volunteer hat when we do these. I, oh, sorry. I don't, well, well it's, hard to, it's hard to take your council person hat off uh, and <laughs> put it back on. Well, no, 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 no. Just Tim. Uh, but I, but I, I will say, with, a, with my council hat on, uh, I do, we do get to hear a lot of, of what you just said. You, you refer to quality of life. Um, it kind of at the, one of the foundational principles of, of some of what your concerns and our concerns are. And, and as a council member, I do hear a lot in conversations. I read a lot about quality of life concerns. And most of the time, those, those are there's a grounded in, we've got too much traffic, we're growing too rapidly, um, or we don't have enough housing for the homeless. And sometimes those sound contradictory to me that if you want to house the homeless, we need more, yeah. we need more homes. We got to do it in a smart way. And I get the frustration with traffic. But at the end of the day, both of those issues, housing, uh, uh, traffic congestion, as they're, as they're defined as quality of life issues, um, are all quality of life issues for people who have already achieved, achieved some measure of quality of life in, in many cases. We're not talking about a population uh, that are totally dependent on us, if they're going to experience quality of life from the day they're born or in their first or that first trimester, right, in the in utero. So um, I do think it's I do think we need to think about this as a community, as a quality of life issue for everybody. Right? Getting a good start in life, one of the ways to do that is to enhance the quality of life and excess opportunity and high quality programs. Bob, you've been in this for a long, long time. Uh, Again, why would you spend so much time and energy as a guy who's achieved what you've achieved professionally, or get to a stage, stage in life where you have a chance to choose to do anything you want to with your days, your nights, uh, your, your interests, and, um, and still be so engaged here with guys like Richard? You mentioned a couple of other old guys who've been in this conversation with you. I don't want to talk to you about the old guys, except I want to talk about why you, as one of the old guys, stay behind. It's all a little correction. 
I'm married, so I can't do everything. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Uh, no, there's lots of ways to, to look at this thing. And, I, and over the last year, if we met and we keep finding more benefits mm -hmm. to having quality early childhood education and a bit more about why it's causing a lot of trouble. I actually brought this up to a group that's run by the district attorney called Access to Justice. And I didn't get any pushback when I said, you know, the disadvantage that minorities and low-income people have of not having the same access to the early childhood education as a lot of us that were making good money, uh, it really is an access to justice because it's an injustice when we give a certain part of the population less access to something that's so important is early childhood education and how that plays out because children that have quality early childhood education are more likely to graduate from high school, go to college, uh, graduate from college, and have a sustainable uh, salary that they can support their family and maybe the members of their families that didn't get that. So that's why I kind of uh, see this as my duty to try to do things for other people that I didn't have to put up with. Uh, in fact, I, can, I know I went to kindergarten, but I really can't remember that far back just what happened. Uh, as, hey, by the way, not an old guy, as youth with an experience. Yeah, right. So all these experienced <laughs> people in this conversation. Uh, there are, uh, I, we have, I have a whole list of questions I'm not going to get to. Uh, because of the, the the way we try to keep this within a reasonable amount of time as a podcast. Uh, so I'm just going to jump to a couple of like lightning round questions. Um, why should a city, given the fact that, that this is a federal issue, state issue, county, why should, why would city councils, why do you think city councils should be uh, focusing, focusing on and budgeting for uh, early childhood child care, and formal and informal education. Right it's, it, it, it's the right thing to do. Truly, it's the right thing to do. Uh, if a while ago you mentioned uh, making sure that the awareness is out there, uh, but I think it's more than just awareness. I think it's awareness plus support. And if we don't have uh, the support coming from somewhere, for example, the Child Care Assistance Program comes from the federal government and it flows over here to the counties. And in some counties, uh, the child care assistance is so low uh, that they give to a family that it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense mm -hmm. when they have to pay this tremendous amount of, of tuition to send a kid to a quality child care uh, facility. So it only makes sense that the money comes from somewhere and it's gotta come probably for us to pay the taxes because we all pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be so compelling, and I and I love what you said in terms of, of when you're looking at the uh, the talent that you want to retain and stuff like that. That's so compelling for city government, for county government, for state government to start thinking about. So I really think that it's the right thing to do, and I really appreciate what city council is doing because you had the political will to get it done. Let's keep it moving, Danielle. Okay, well, I'm going to say it's the powerful thing to do because those dollars that a local area invests, for one, they stay local and they multiply. And for another, the impacts are immediate. Those children that are served, they age out very quickly, but you've served them and you've done the right thing. We have, I know that the city of Longmont is going to be investing um, in evidence-based programs, proven strategies. Uh, and that's what's exciting. And the money's staying local. I like to see it turn over and over again in a local community and create strength and quality of life. And just so listeners know, the second of these podcasts will focus on the, some of the evidence-based mm -hmm. evidence program and what we're doing with that, mm -hmm. both formal and informal uh, learning opportunities in Longmont but with another outstanding panel. Lightning round, Bob. Okay, so we talk about expense, but there is a return. Uh, the usual mantra is the return on investment is seven to 15. So I don't think the city council is investing in better than that. <laughs> seven or to $15 for every dollar we spend. Yes. And also there's things that we don't think about. Uh, if the parent doesn't have to be staying home with kids, they're working. 
and they're buying stuff in the community. So that decreases the overall cost and they're paying other taxes and we're not needing to provide as many benefits for people. So there is a return that's not always obvious. That you reduce costs societally, yes. right? Uh, what we know is high school graduates, graduates live longer lives with, with less expense for health care, less social costs for incarceration and the, you know, the, 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 the other kinds of consequences of insufficient access to education. And the place to start that is when they're born, right, Jessica? I think, I mean, from an economic development perspective, the ROI of investment in any level of education um, within a community is um, significant. Um, I don't think there's any point in history or geographic location that you can point to um, that has invested in education um, to create opportunity and wealth within their community, that that investment has not paid a return. And so I think thinking about it from that perspective, um, Longmont Economic Development Partnership and um, with the city of Longmont has really taken an economic development approach, approach um, that was really came out of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institute coming from a, um, a book called The Metropolitan Revolution and then a, a follow-on book called The New Localism, which really says that regions and cities today need to take the reins in some of these bigger um, transformational initiatives rather than waiting for our federal and state governments, which in a lot of cases are in kind of a, a, a fiasco <laughs> right, right now, rather than just sitting and waiting for those resources to trickle down and come and address those issues for us. So those are things like transportation, education, early childhood education, even innovation and entrepreneurship, things where resources a lot of times historically had come from federal and state governments that we just can't wait for anymore if we want to have successful, viable, resilient um, local economies, not just for us today, but for our, our children and our children's children in, into the future. All right, I'm going to, we'll start with you, come the other direction. Uh, this is, there are two more questions. Sure. The last one's any closing thoughts, but this one is, if people who listen to this or, or watch this video um, are motiv motivated to become part of what is a growing coalition of interests around this topic of providers, parents, early child care givers, uh, advocates or activists, how do they do it? So are there opportunities through LEDP? Um, are, are there ways for for your organization to bring people into the fold on this and the other things that you do at LEDP? There are. Uh, we actually just um, formally adopted Advanced Long Month 2.0, which is our updated economic development strategy, uh, which really focuses on a collective impact structure that brings all members of the community into these conversations, as well in, as into the active work of uh, economic development in our community, with one of the focus areas being talent, part of why I'm here today. Um, and one of the strategic initiatives within our um, talent focus area being around early childhood education. And so um, advanced.longmont.org um, is the website. You can see all of the data that backs that economic development strategy, including some around education and talent, and um, also look at the action plans that are there and get our contact information to be able to participate, whether it be talent or placemaking or transportation or um, industry growth working groups that we have actively uh, working now. And the key to all that is the collective action yes. strategy mm -hmm. and theory of action. And that's where a uh, broad base can get involved and move the dial. In Absolutely. LAD. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Bob, so same question. Uh, are there opportunities for people to get involved? Oh. If they're motivated by listening to us? Of course. Or by anything that comes Or such nice people. <laughs> yeah. that should come to. No, uh, this group that started about a year ago that's gone from four to 40 plus, and you mentioned some of the members. We are meeting on February 10th at the St. Cajun. Uh, St. Stephen's. St. Stephen's, Stephen's Church. Stephen's Church. <laughs> second, um, the second Monday of every month. Right. At, at two o'clock. At two o'clock. And everybody's welcome. Every time we have a meeting, some more people come. And it's really been important to have all of these different voices. Uh, because that's how we it's get three o'clock. You're right. It's three o'clock. <laughs> three o'clock, yeah. I'm always right. <laughs> The first thing you use that too. Yeah, that's a different meeting. Okay. But anyway, uh, we welcome everybody to come. We need your voices. We need your thoughts, particularly if you're somebody who has uh, struggled with this issue of providing child care for your children. Can you? Okay, how can you get involved? Well, um, there's a long month coalition we just talked about. Um, three o'clock, uh, second Monday of the month. That's the place to go. <laughs> Uh, if you're online, you can visit the Early Childhood uh, Council Boulder County website, www.eccbouldercounty.org. 
Uh, and then there's plenty of places to get involved there. But what I'd say if you're at home and you're feeling like, oh, I've got to do something, read. Read to your child. Put your phone down and read to your child. That's something you can do right away. Very positive. You don't have to wait on anybody else for that? Don't have to wait on anybody else. Richard. And you can have a lot of fun. <laughs> you mentioned a while ago, Bob, that uh, as a privileged white person, uh, that that's what drove you to work for minorities or work with minorities and, and, and Latinos in, in our county here and all over the state of Colorado. I like that because one of the things that I live by, and that is the whole mantra of don't do for me without me. Yes. So uh, for the Latino community that's out there, uh, Los que hablan español se pueden envolver con la coalición de padres del estado de Colorado y también con el paso, Engage Latino Parents Advancing Student Outcomes. Those are opportunities that I think our Latino community can, can actually go get uh, and become super involved in terms of early care and education in Boulder County and also the city of Longmont. Providers Advancing Student Outcomes is a program that was created by the Statewide Parent Coalition that provides high intensity child care and development uh, uh, classes for Latino parents so that they can become qualified and quality child care providers for the city of Longmont. And if you know that in Colorado, uh, over 60%, at least 60% of the kids that are in child care are in family, friend, and neighbor child care. So we can't forget that. Yeah. Okay, so let me just add that real quickly. Two things. One, we are starting to do the programs in English now. And the other thing, we are opening another set of trainings for PASO in Longmont on March 3rd, I think is the right date. So you can go on our website and figure out how to reach in. There Otherwise, you, you can just contact me. All right, any one sentence last thoughts? Anybody? Go ahead. If not, I'll wrap it up. Yes. Well, I was, I was gonna, I, I do wanna swing back to emphasizing that early care and education is a uh, gender equity issue and it is a community equity issue. Um, early care and education is an identified social determinant of health. We get it right and we contribute to the, the um, lifelong wellness of that individual and the circles and circles. Right. And, and what that does, uh, Tim, is really go against this whole racist attitude of the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And I'll just take the opportunity then to also reinforce that it's also an economic development issue. Um, a good friend of mine and, and colleague uh, coined the term a number of years ago, more than a decade ago, the Colorado Paradox that um, talks about um, this idea that we have one of the most highly educated workforces in the country while investing um, at the very lowest level, 48th, 49th, 47th, in um, public education, K through 12 education in this state. And that's been as a result of our ability to attract talent um, to this state. Our net in migration has outpaced every other state in the country for most years that I've been doing this. And the reality of it, though is that we're at a tipping point um, because one of the ways that we've been able to attract talent is through affordability. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, we are the most expensive market um, off of the coasts in this country. And so as that affordability factor goes away, so goes away our ability to continue to attract that level of talent, which further reinforces the need to invest in education at all levels, early childhood, K through 12, and higher education for um, students and, and children in this state, growing, born in the state and growing up in the state. And, and very quickly, I'm glad you mentioned the color paradox because early child, early child education crosses uh, politics uh, and party lines and all of that stuff because the paradox was identified by <coughs> the Republican administration. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, <clears throat> we started this with uh, asking the question, uh, why would we? Why would any city be involved with this? My my answer was because the stakes are so high that if we don't get this right for all of us, right? Um, if, that if we don't get this right now, we'll never get get it right for the youngest of us, and that's what we need to do. So, um, this is the first of three podcasts on early childhood education and child care. Uh, we covered a lot of big picture here. We'll drill down in the next one on formal and informal pre 
uh, pre-K education and learning opportunities. So hopefully listeners will stay with us. Um, thanks for the time you gave us for this podcast and tune in again.